Hey, my name is Doug Spencer. I am the co-CEO of Bold Exchange, the most convenient way to buy Black online. And you are listening to Max Out Time with AJ2. Now, I'm not AJ2, but for Black Business Month, Max Out Time has partnered with Bold Exchange to really put a spotlight on Black business owners and the change makers that help them thrive. And I have the pleasure on this episode of speaking with Dr. Elizabeth Claiborne. Dr. Claiborne, how are you? I'm doing great. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for making the time. And before we really jump into it, I want to say, so you can catch this episode and others, please subscribe on all major podcast platforms. Um, and also on YouTube, if you're watching this, you can hit that subscribe button. Um, with that being said, Dr. Claiborne, again, thank you. And just tell a little bit of, uh, to the viewers and listeners about who Dr. Claiborne is and, and what you, the amazing work that you're doing right now. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I feel like I have a really non-traditional path as a CEO and entrepreneur. Um, I'm actually a physician, an emergency physician. I still actually clinically practice with the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, and so I developed a medical device called Bleed Freeze, which treats nosebleeds in children and adults and will be the next band-aid of nosebleeds is what we're working towards. Uh, and I had a really kind of interesting origin story of this company and how I've been able to accelerate its growth growth in the last couple of years. Uh, and so one of the things I wanted to point out is that, you know, I don't have a business background. I did not like, you know, grow up saying I was going to be a business owner. I was in residency training and emergency met residency you know, planning to go into academic medicine. I actually have a master's in bioethics. I'm really interested in ethics. I talk a lot about end of life care, health policy, health disparities. And I was really kind of set up to like, you know, launch my career coming out of residency to be this practicing physician. Uh, but I ran into a lot of patients that have nosebleeds and I just was kind of perturbed by them sometimes because I couldn't believe they would come to the ER for a problem that I thought was relatively simple. And I soon discovered that they didn't have great solutions either in the ER or outside. And so I came up with a solution called Bleed Freeze. And so when I fell into this, I got some really great mentorship from the very beginning about how to protect my intellectual property and, and file my patents so that they would be attached to me and my company only. And then also how to validate that I was actually solving a problem Problem that people would pay money for. Uh, and so I participated in the NSF i in 2015 when I founded my company. And we did a lot of customer discovery to make sure that we were validating that this was a real problem that I had a real solution to that would actually make money. And I think that those were like really key steps in making me successful early on with my business. Uh, and since then, I've been able to really grow the business, especially actually in the last year, uh, utilizing some accelerator programs, uh, some mentorship, and actually recently getting some investment from both angels and venture capital, which have uh, prepared us to enter the market in 2022. I think a lot of the best entrepreneurial stories start with, I wasn't trying to do this. I didn't say, hey, I've got to make a lot of money. I've got to start a company. Your idea hit you, um, which I think is amazing. And I think, can you tell a little bit more about how did you get introduced to some of the programs and the mentors you had? Because I think when you talk about it not being your background, a lot of Black entrepreneurs don't have the resources that others have. So what was the path for you to be exposed to those mentors and programs? I trained at GW and GW has an innovation center there. And one of my attendings uh, was leading in the innovation center. So when I came to him and said, hey, I have this idea, what do you think about it? Um, he was able to tie me to that network. And first of all, connect me to a law firm that worked with the university that could help to kind of start filing my preliminary IP, uh, but also make sure that like, I was clarifying if I was working with the university or just myself to make sure them know that like, you know, I was a resident, I wasn't employed by the university. This was my idea and that it was going to be assigned to me and my company only. And so uh, that, that kind of looking, I think, at universities, if you're tied into them, all of them actually usually have offices of technology transfer and innovation centers. And a lot of times there are people there and it's like their jobs to like look for resources for people who might just have ideas. But I think more than, you know, specific resources they gave me, there was a network there. So through, you know, those connections, I just kept meeting people who introduced me to other people who introduced me to other people and that's how we stumbled upon a lot of the opportunities. I will highlight that the NSF i which is a program that anyone can participate in, especially those that are looking at life science and medical devices, uh, is a great national program. You get free grant money from the from the you know, government and you're kind of paid to do what I talked about with like customer discovery and talking to customers and making sure that you're you know, validating your problem and your solution. Uh, so those were the things I think that 
for me were instrumental in me being successful early. Um, but I also want to emphasize that, you know, when you get into this, you have to, you know, perpetuate yourself. You have to kind of put yourself out there. You have to keep asking questions. You have to ask for favors. You have to ask for introductions, but they will come back. And people for the most part are happy to like say, Hey, I know someone who, you know, is doing, you know, a medical device accelerator. Um, you know, this is the application link. I can put a good you know word in for you, or especially when you're fundraising, it is definitely all about kind of word of mouth. I've kind of learned that I've been introduced to several angel groups by pitching to other angel groups. And I'll get in there and someone will want to support me. And then they kind of say, hey, this is a great idea. I want you to also pitch to this other group. Uh, and there's a lot of these organizations that are dedicated to looking at minority and women-owned business. So you make sure that you're maximizing that and you're highlighting that when you talk about yourself as a business owner, make sure it's front and center that you know that's your background because there's specific special programs and resources for people like us. It's kind of a connecting the dots, right? You don't have it all at the beginning. Um, and I love a phrase, you didn't say it in, in that question or that answer, but when you first started, you kept saying, um, a real problem. Am I solving a real problem with a real solution? I think that's so hard to figure out at the beginning. Is this real? Is this something that people will pay for? Um, so I definitely think mentorship can help with that. Um, we're now in 2021 and you gave a snippet there. You've, you've been an adjunct professor. You've actually been practicing. How did you find the time? Um, it sounds like you're really leaning into almost full time now into the business, but how did you find the time over that course, those few years or, or half a decade, I guess, to really still be growing the company, but also doing and wearing the other hats that you have? Yeah. Well, it's funny because my husband is a serial entrepreneur as well. And so he was always a proponent of me just like jumping in when I first found the idea and was like, you should just, you know, we can like, you know, not have to buy a house and invest hundred percent in your company. And, you know, he is definitely that type of person who goes at it hundred percent. I had just gotten out of residency and dedicated, you know, half of my life to training to be a doctor. And so for me, I wanted to be able to kind of continue that training. But I also think that as a founder of a medical device, being a practicing clinician has been advantageous, right? I'm doing studies of, of pilot studies of my device in hospitals because I have that academic affiliation. I think that people take me seriously and listen to what I have to say because I have clinical experience and an academic position. And so I wanted to continue building that part of my career while I built the business. And it is hard. I mean, like I also in this time frame got married, had two kids, um, you know, moved into a house. I have student loans I'm paying off, like juggling all that in life is difficult. And I had to spend a lot of my personal money invested in this business, which means a lot of other things kind of got put on the back burner. But now I'm definitely seeing that payout and I've been able to get the opportunity because we're getting funding now to kind of take down my clinical work so that I can really invest. And I think ultimately for any CEO and founder like that is what it's going to take. But I do encourage people to understand that you, it doesn't mean you have to give up everything else in your life and everything else in your life sometimes is what makes you who you are. And that might be why you are shining, right? You might be that kind of person because of your other experiences and it will attract other people who want to support you in your business. Yeah, thank you so much for your openness. I'm like, oof, I don't know if I could have done all those things in that time frame, But I think it's really important that that people hear that because at least publicly, it's really portrayed, oh, you've got to go all in. It's the only way to do it. Um, and I think that goes a little bit to black women getting only 1% of the funding or you know, founders of color getting 2%, whatever it is. We don't always have that luxury to just go all in if we don't have the things, you know, the resources, we got to pay student loans, et cetera. Um, so I think that is amazing that you've been able to do this and really leverage your experience to be an advantage for your company. And you touched on like your, your testing. I'm very curious, I've never had a nosebleed. And I did see a video that, that you recorded and say about 40 people, never 40 percent of people never have one. I'm like, oh, that's me. Um, but like, what has been that process like the iteration for you to continue to improve your product? I'm definitely curious about that. Yeah, so we started prototyping, you know, kind of the, the first year that we had it where I was just playing with things. And now we have a design and engineering firm that we're working with that are going to be give, you know, giving me my MVP, my minimum viable product that we're going to be piloting in an urgent care and ER setting this coming year. Um, and so it is definitely a long process. Like, you know, you can ask any kind of inventor and they'll tell you that they're a little bit of a perfectionist. This is their baby. They want it to look perfect. Uh, but I had someone who mentored me, give me really great advice 
advice, which is if it's perfect when you put it on the market, it's too late. So you actually have to just push through getting what you can to the market and you're always going to get feedback from people, but it's actually being out there and getting customer feedback or research feedback that will allow you to kind of change those design um, features that you need to in order to be successful. So don't be afraid to like just get out there. Some people just get out there and start selling and then that's how they, you know, they can position themselves to get the product to like their opt its optimal state. For us, we've had to, you know, had a long journey, like really looking at a lot of things, right? In the era of COVID right now in manufacturing, it's really challenging. There's a lot of materials that are harder to find. Everything takes way longer than expected. Um, you have to think very carefully about where you're sourcing your manufacturing, um, what your distribution is gonna look like. And that's all complicated in the global market that we live in. So, you know, I had to think like, am I gonna pull any supplies from China or am I gonna try not to do that until I'm bigger? How does like, getting my device out there, expose my intellectual property and make it vulnerable. And what can I do to protect that? And so th there's a lot of simultaneous things you want to think about when you're doing iterations of the device. But for me, I'm really excited about you know, doing a pilot first, which for medical devices is a good way to enter the market uh, where you kind of get feedback in this ecosystem of a hospital or urgent care setting, and then you know, stepping out from there to actually get sales and you know, real live customer feedback. Yeah. Are you working with a select number of hospitals for your pilot or how's the pilot going to be designed? Yeah. So, you know, I'm actually one of the uh, pilot locations is going to be an urgent care setting in Houston. And the reason we're going there is I did a uh, pitch for a Ignite Women's Pitch Competition uh, for those women out there. I, I definitely encourage you to look it up. It was a great experience for me. I did very well. I went into the finals. I was actually awarded $150,000 of venture capital funding uh, for participating in that. But I also was introduced to Dr. Juliet Breeze, who was one of my judges. And she just so happened to be an emergency physician who owns a chain of urgent cares in Houston. And she thought my device was really uh, smart and she liked it. So she's talked to me and she's actually investing now in my pre-seed round, in addition to allowing us to use her urgent care uh, locations in Houston. And then she would be someone who placed one of my very first purchase orders. Uh, so that's just like an example of how like, you know, putting yourself out there and doing competitions or getting no, you never know what's going to fall into your lap. Um, I met her from that. And then she herself has actually introduced me to a number of people within the angel network who have also come to help support us. So we're doing their urgent care site. And then we're also going to do an ED setting, an emergency department within the University of Maryland medical system, which is where where I work, um, just to get feedback from both of those types of locations. People assume that it's luck, you know, oh, it happened to them or it happened, you know, over here, it won't happen to me. But I think you talked about the snowball effect of, of putting yourself out there, because if someone only heard the end of that story, they'd be like, wow, that's lucky. But no, it's because I submitted to this pitch competition, mm -hmm. I made it to the finals, I met this judge, the judge loved my presentation that I worked on. And it's like on and on and on. So that is so amazing. What were some things that let you know that your MVP was right or it was time to go after a pilot? Like you said, if, if it's perfect, it's too far. But what were some benchmarks that in your head were like, OK, this is the right stage for us to, to really lean into this pilot? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you're never going to feel like you're 100 percent ready. Uh, what I feel is that we've been working on the MVP for the last year, the, you know, the prototype, tweaking it, looking at the materials and um, in in vitro right like in the lab setting or with the few ones that I have and I share with friends it looks like it's going to work so I'm like let's just you know launch and get this pilot done and we're not you know the pilot isn't a huge number of people that we're going to pilot on probably around 30 people at each location but that's really valuable feedback uh, and I'm doing this before we enter the market so that we can do any iterations or you know tweaks to the device before we enter the market so now is the time right because I want to get to the market in 2022 and so I need to do these pilots now so that I can make changes so I would look at it more as like as soon as you can as soon as you have something you think reasonably works go out there and get that feedback get that testing because it's either going to work fabulously and you're going to be ready to roll or you're going to find a, a problem and you need to like identify that solution sooner than later so it's better to have that underway yeah and I think something that just came to mind based on that answer you talked about the timing can be so tricky and I know having patents that puts you on a clock to a certain degree how did you think about for other medical device or other entrepreneurs with IP, how did you find that balance between this is the timeline for this process, but also to go to market? Like, did you have any issues or, or challenges there trying to line things up? 
Yeah, I mean, securing IP is a very tedious and expensive process. Um, you know, I, I sunk probably at least $40,000 of my own money into getting my patent secured. It takes way longer than you think. Uh, there's just, and then, and then you have to consider that's for like my US IP. Then I had to think about like, do I have any money to even like, you know, uh, we did file a PCT, which is like something to kind of globally give you time to file in other countries. But you have to decide, like, am I going to invest in filing all these other countries? And what I decided is that I really am going to have to focus on where I think I'll be successful in the market first. And so for us, we're starting in the U.S. So we did all of our IP in the U.S. And as soon as I got that done, then we started kind of lining up things in order to uh, get the testing underway, build these prototypes and get into the market. Um, so it is a little bit of a, a race against time, but you want to do it correctly, right? Because it takes a lot of money to get these things done and you don't want to invest a lot of your early funds when you're growing as a company in something that is not done well. So for example, the pre-seed round that I'm doing right now, $500,000 raise, I've actually gotten 330 of that so far, which is really exciting. Um, but you know, those dollars, I need to be really careful about how I spend them. So we are investing in marketing. We're investing in what our e-commerce site is going to look like. We're investing in doing these pilot studies so that we do go in the market. We have the best opportunity to be successful. And I'll just say that I, I think those that thought process is what makes us uh, successful as CEO and founders. I have a uh, executive coach who I work with, and he always reminds me that even though Black women make up less than 1% of people getting venture capital, we are statistically known for being the most uh, judicious with use of funds, and we actually use funds more successfully than any other type of entre entrepreneur or founder. That's a, a gem, and no one should be surprised by that. By We've been any. used to, we're always used to being on a budget. Like, we know how this is. Like, you know, it's probably just because of our culture, right, and what we've had to do with and always juggling, but, you know, that, you apply that to your business as well. Yeah, that's amazing. I think I do want to lean into one, your, su your support. You've talked about the executive coach now, the different programs that you've done. Um, but you mentioned briefly that your spouse is also a, an entrepreneur. Do you feel like that has been a, a good support system for you as well? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think that especially as a woman, it is really hard to be a professional woman, right? Just my career in medicine requires a lot of time, a lot of sacrifice. Um, and if I didn't have a spouse who was supportive and believed in me, it would create a lot of you know, challenge at home because you'd be battling all this, you know, outside of your home to get things done, but also then just feeling like, you know, you, you don't have that home base and that support. I mean, he has always believed in me and always like pushed me. And because he's an entrepreneur himself, he doesn't have issue with the risk. I think that that's the biggest thing that people are not used to is like, oh my gosh, am I really going to like invest a lot of my money in this? And the answer has to be yes. You have to believe in yourself more than anyone else. And your spouse should probably be the one that believes in you just as much. So that has been a great, um, you know, source of support of me. And he also supports, you know, the way that I'm choosing to go about this because he has his opinions about how he would run his business. I'm a little bit more conservative than him and it's taken longer, but I think now he's seeing some of the things that I'm doing, how it's paid off. And I've been able to bounce our career and also do other things that are important in life, right? Like I think I emphasize when I interview medical students or residents that it's hard to be successful if you're unhappy. So you have to have some balance in your life. Like it was important for me to be married and have my two beautiful daughters. Those are all things that uh, really add to me as a CEO and founder. And it's not just about business all day long. It's about having like a successful life that people can be attracted to and really believe you have that sustainability moving forward. Right. That's amazing. Um, and I want to pivot a little bit to bring in, like you mentioned, you are so successful in many ways, but I want to bring in the medical side too, outside of the entrepreneurial medical side. Um, at some point, things will open back up. Who knows when that will be? But a lot of entrepreneurs and offices will have to consider what does it look like in this new reality of us potentially having more time away from home and back in the office. Are there certain things that you think entrepreneurs should really be cognizant of as they consider that transition back? I, mean, I think all businesses because of COVID-19 have really rethought their infrastructure and what is essential to, first of all, having employees be productive, but also having employees be balanced and happy. A lot of them are moving away from bring, going back to the office if that's not productive. And, and maybe you're in a business where you do need their, everyone to be in that space and you know, it allows like those juices to mix and you to brainstorm and that's essential. But for other people, maybe that's not necessary. And so, you know, cutting off that trans, you know, the time that you're commuting 
commuting to work and having to go to work and giving them more family time, I think is helpful. And I think another thing that the pandemic has really highlighted is what I talked about again, which is like balance. I mean, a lot of us have had to really think about our own mortality or the mortality of the ones that we love or how quickly things can change. Um, or just like a lot of the uncertainty that the world has faced, I think has made people re-examine what's most important to them. And so for me, it has been a motivating factor to really make sure that um, I'm working hard and I'm serving as an example of a black female physician, as well as a successful entrepreneur and founder, because I know that there's other little black girls and boys that see me when I'm interviewing on TV, whether it's as a doctor or as a business owner, and it's going to let them know that, you know, the sky's the limit, they can go after these dreams. Uh, and even though there's a lot of scary and uncertain things taking place in this world, there's still the opportunity to be successful. Yes, this is inspiration to me. And I'm like, oh, let me take some notes while I'm, while I'm listening to you. I think I want to end with one last question. Um, you said you have 3.30 race to secure your race. I got to imagine that Max Out Time will some way find its way on your Twitter or, or Google search and a potential investor is going to watch this. Like, what would you want them to know about what you're doing and how they might be able to, to benefit and be a part of the close of your pre-seed round? Sure. Um, I am happy to be contacted by anyone who's interested in joining the Bleed Freeze journey. Um, I do believe that my device will be the next Band-Aid of nosebleeds. It has a very large 5 billion plus market. And as a physician, I know exactly why it's needed, where it can be used, and how it can be uh, essentially in the medicine of cabinets of people across the world. Um, currently, if you're interested in investing, you can always go to our website, uh, bleedfreeze.com. And there's uh, information there for how to contact me. But you can also, you know, anyone who has questions about anything related to the business or just wants to talk to me uh, as far as like learning more about my experience, I'm happy to talk to you as well. As I said, a lot of people have brought me up behind them. So I'm always looking for opportunities to look back and look at other people who were in positions that I was in maybe five years ago, uh, but email me at eclayborn at bleedfreeze.com. And then certainly I'd uh, love for any of you guys interested in what I'm doing to follow me on Twitter and IG at Dr. Eliz PZ. PC, so E-L-I-Z-P-C. And that's where you'll see me talk about my business, but also a lot of what I think about what's going on with the COVID-19 pandemic and how sensitive our communities of color have been to this and what important issues we should be paying attention to. Dr. Claiborne, you have no idea how perfect that was because usually we end with asking people, how can they contact you? You already did <laughs> that. You already <laughs> answered that question. So not just investors, I think anyone should be following you, not only, like you said, to learn about what's so pressing medically in our space, but I think you have a great story already and a company that's really gonna to blossom. So um, thank you so much for being on. And again, I will say this is max out time um, with AJ too, but Doug for now. Um, and you can subscribe on all major podcasting platforms as well as YouTube. If you're watching this, hit subscribe. Um, and again, Dr. Claiborne, thank you so much for making the time to share your, your story. Thank you for having me.